everyone. It's Michelle Caruana from Play Cafe Academy and Profitable Play. And I'm excited to bring to you today one of my favorite videos to record all year. And that is the video where I predict the indoor play industry trends for the coming year. So this is going to be predicting trends for 2023. I've done this for the last couple of years. And to be honest, not to pat myself on the back too much, but I've been pretty spot on. And as I was going through my video from the same time last year when I was predicting the 2022 trends, a lot of these trends are going to be very similar because last time I made this video, we were kind of coming out of the pandemic, numbers were going way down, and everyone was kind of adjusting to the new normal. And now we're getting ready to face a recession. So we're in a very similar position. So a lot of these trends are similar, but I have some new case studies, some new examples, and some new resources to share with you to make sure your indoor playground is keeping up with the trends and is as profitable as possible. And I have a ton of great podcast episodes where I've taken a really deep dive into some of these different topics. So I will be linking those under the video in the video description. So if you want to dive again, much deeper into any of these topics or trends, the description of this video is where you're going to find that information. And as always, I would love to welcome you inside Play Cafe Academy and Playmaker Society if you want to fast track your indoor playground to success and profitability. All right, so the first trend that I'm predicting is keeping things in-house. Now, this is new from 2022. So kind of during the pandemic, we were doing a lot of delegating. We were really trying to keep our businesses as lean as possible and keep all of our operating expenses down, keep all of our investments down, because we just didn't know what the future was going to hold. There was a lot of uncertainty. And while there is still a lot of economic uncertainty, I've noticed that a lot more indoor playgrounds are keeping more of their services in-house instead of delegating them to other local businesses. Now, whenever possible, I just want to put a disclaimer out there. I love supporting other local businesses when possible. However, again, as we face a recession, we need to be smart as business owners. And if we're spending way too much hiring outside services and characters and entertainers and decorators, that's going to eat into our profit margin. And again, while I love supporting other businesses, if we can't remain sustainable, then we can't continue serving our communities and we can't continue partnering with small businesses anyways. So right now, I've seen a lot more indoor playground owners, like I said, keep these extra services in-house. So they've been teaching themselves how to do balloon decor, garlands, arches, columns, things like that. I've seen a lot more indoor playground owners purchase their own character costumes. So recently on my YouTube channel, I interviewed Tiffany from My Play Cafe, and she was talking about how purchasing character costumes really intentionally. So she was seeking out characters that not a lot of other character providers or playgrounds or other event planners were providing in her area. So Bluey was a great example. Nobody had a Bluey costume really in her area. So she made the investment in one and now she does Bluey events all the time. They've been a huge source of revenue for her. So go back and watch that video if you want to learn, to learn more about how to host successful character events. But she noticed that she was spending so much money hiring these characters from other providers. So again, by being really intentional and strategic, she's able to make these investments and have them pay for themselves in just one or two events. And now she has Bluey available to rent for birthday parties and other events and get togethers and things like that. So I've again, I've noticed a lot more people doing that to make sure that they're keeping as much of their profit as possible. Because again, we wanna remain sustainable through the upcoming recession. All right, number two, this is going to be no surprise to anybody who follows my channel, but that is memberships. Open play is just not something that we can rely on, especially during a recession. Open play customers or day pass customers, or I guess what I like to call casual customers, they're going to be the first ones to cut out indoor playgrounds from their budgets as we head to the recession. It's going to be the people who have who are more invested in your business, who have integrated it as part of their routine, who have made it a part of their schedule and have made attending your space a priority, they're going to be the ones that stick around and continue to support you. And they're likely going to be the ones that are still able to support you because 
again, I hate saying this, but not everybody is going to be impacted in the same way throughout the recession. So I would really focus on quality over quantity. So what I mean by that is you want to really focus on getting more recurring memberships, fostering relationships with those customers, making sure they feel validated and heard and appreciated. This is the time to reach out to them and ask if you're not providing anything that they'd like to see, or if they're thinking about canceling, get ahead of that and ask what you can do or what you can provide to keep that membership active. Have them invite their friends, neighbors. This is a time when you really need to start thinking about, again, reaching out to those members, really nailing down your membership offer, making sure that it is going to still continue to be profitable throughout the recession. And make sure that, again, they feel heard and that those members are creating new membership opportunities. So like I said, give them free bring a friend passes so that they can bring in people who might convert to new members. But we just can't rely on pure volume of open play traffic when we're in a recession. Because again, those people that have not integrated your business into their routine or became more invested or dedicated to your business, they're going to be the first ones to kind of drop off because they don't see your business as a necessity. And yes, you can do some education around why play is so important, why play is a necessity, why bringing your kids around changes of scenery is so important. It's just the fact of the matter that open play is going to see the sharpest decline as people really tighten up their budgets and start spending less on entertainment or non-essential categories. So focus on memberships. That's going to be a huge determining factor between the businesses that survive the recession and the coming years and the businesses that don't make it. So I just put out a YouTube video or two videos actually about the two main types of revenue you should focus on for a sustainable business, especially in uncertain economic times. And one was big ticket items like birthday parties, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then the other was recurring revenue. So again, if you want to dive a lot deeper on those topics, I go through two actual business examples and I share about business A, who focuses on open play and business B, who focuses on memberships. And we kind of go through these exercises of calculating their profits, calculating how many sales they need to meet their expenses. So that was really an eye-opening exercise for a lot of people. And I got so many DMs and messages and comments of people who said, you know, I wasn't really sold on memberships, but after watching that exercise, after watching that video, I'm completely sold. So I want to encourage you to, again, go to the description of this video if you want to learn more about how focusing on memberships and big ticket sales can mean all the difference, not just in your bottom line, but also in how joyful this business is for you and how much you get out of it as an entrepreneur. All right, number three is classes and education. This was again a trend from 2022, but I really seen it continue in 2023 because classes, things like that, things that are more rooted in education are going to be seen as more essential to parents and they're going to be less likely to cut them out if they think there is, again, that educational value and not just getting the energy out. Even though, like I said, we all know that play is essential and it's so important to early childhood development. Fact of the matter is that, like I said, people are not going to have as much disposable income to spend. So if you can provide more value, extra value, more educational resources to your customers, that's going to be a huge, again, determining factor in your success in 2023. Now, I love what Alicia from Gentle Hands in Tallahassee, uh, Florida does. And kind of what she did when she was thinking about her class schedule and what she was going to offer is she did a lot of competitive research and she said, okay, what classes are already available? I'm going to go the opposite direction. And I'm going to make sure that I provide unique class offerings that are not offered elsewhere so that people are going to come to me for them. So things like uh, story time and sing along, things like bilingual play group. She has really unique service offerings that, again, you can't find elsewhere. So it's going to be elsewhere. So it's going to be really important more now more than ever to stand out against your competition and to offer something really unique. So I really see a lot more indoor playgrounds embracing the classes and educational aspects, again, as people tighten their budgets. All right, number four is co working and childcare. So a lot of people that were kind of taken out of the workforce during the pandemic, they're entering that workforce again. And there are so many more 
work from home job opportunities now than there were a couple years ago. So something that I've seen a lot more indoor playgrounds embrace is co-working and childcare. So what I mean by co-working is somebody can come with their laptop and their child can engage in supervised play. So there might be one play attendant for every four or five children. And what I love about that is that the parents are still in the building. So if the child needs a snack or if the child needs a bathroom break or something like that, the attendant can simply approach the parent, they can take care of it, and then the child can go back to playing and the parent can go back to working. I was recently at Cafe O Play in Ohio and they actually had a silent pod that you could run out by the hour if parents needed to make a call or just needed some space away from the play area, away from the noise to get some quiet work done or something like that. So I've seen these types of things pop up all over in indoor playgrounds, even in facilities like Cafe O Play who have been open for 10 years and have never before offered something like this, but they've recognized the need, they've recognized the drastic increase in parents working from home and the need for these types of solutions. Another one is Tumbles Play Cafe in Buffalo. She does a co-op, so it's kind of like a school a co-working situation. So it's just short-term childcare where you do not need a daycare license. And it allows those working parents who need a couple of hours to meet their deadlines or take some calls or things like that. It allows them to have flexible childcare, flexible education options for their babies, infants, toddlers. So I definitely have seen an increase in that in 2022, and I expect to see that throughout 2023 and beyond. All right, number five, I kind of alluded to this when I was talking about memberships, but a bigger focus on parties and private events. Because again, in that video where I talked about the two main types of revenue that you should focus on, big ticket and recurring, I talked about how much easier it is to just serve 100 or 200 party clients every single year, as opposed to having to service 25, 30, 50 open play customers every single day. One birthday party that's valued at $1,000 could be the same amount of revenue that you bring in with 100 open play customers. So as I mentioned, not everyone is going to be affected the same by the recession. So it's so much easier to find 100 or 200 people that are still able to book those premium parties or book your private events or things like that than have to rely on getting hundreds and hundreds of people in the door every single week. Again, that's just not realistic. So focus on bigger ticket sales from a smaller group of people so that we can continue to pay our bills. We, of course, want to make sure that we're still being able to welcome as many people as possible into our space. But again, we also have to remember that we have to pay our bills. We have to remain in the green or else we're not going to be able to continue serving our community and providing that positive impact well past the recession. So parties, private events, I think that, again, because people are bringing things like characters and decorating and balloons in house, the parties are going to be a lot more profitable for indoor playgrounds in general because we're able to keep more of that profit. And then number six, I talked about this last year as well, is a bigger focus on gross motor play. So as we made our way through the pandemic, now that we're getting used to the new normal, again, I really see a decrease in the little tiny toys that need constant cleaning in ball pits and things that are definitely going to contribute more to the spread of germs than a big play structure that you can simply mist or have cleaned with UV or something like that. So I've definitely seen a bigger focus on gross motor play because it's easier to clean, easier to sanitize, there's less small pieces, less toys going into mouths and things like that. And it's just so much easier to keep tidy as well. I remember because we focused on imaginative play, if we even had three kids playing, it would be a complete mess. Our floor would be completely scattered with play food and dress up clothes and things like that within just a few minutes of a few kids playing. So I've definitely seen a shift away from, again, those smaller parts. I definitely still see a lot of places doing imaginative play, but they're keeping a it a little bit more simple. There's a lot more wall toys with pieces that can't be pulled away from the wall, things that children can actually manipulate on the toy, again, without having to separate that from the structure. So more focus on gross, gross motor, uh, more simple imaginative play structures, 
And something that Tiffany from my play cafe does is she has a lot of her smaller uh, toys with little pieces. She has them outside the play area and parents have to actually go get them off a shelf. They can take it to a table. And that kind of forces the parent to really supervise their child so that pieces aren't going in the mouth, germs aren't getting spread in that way. And that they're not littering the play area so people can trip over them or just so that it looks in you know, a huge state of disarray. So I've seen, again, either people move those types of toys outside of the play area to encourage parent participation or places just doing away with them in general because, again, we are still seeing a lot of germ-conscious customers. All right, next is I definitely see a lot more indoor playgrounds adding cafes, and that is not an accident. This is kind of goes to the point about keeping more things in-house. We know parents like coffees and teas and smoothies and things like that. We know that if they don't get them from us, they're going to get them somewhere else. So this is just another opportunity to keep that profit in-house and not have all of the parents running to Starbucks before they come to your facility. And I have an entire podcast series about why having a cafe is so essential to the long-term success of indoor playgrounds. This is something that I feel so passionately about. And a lot of people say, well, I don't have any cafe experience. I'm telling you, I had zero cafe experience. I barely knew how to make a cup of coffee. But I reached out to my local coffee roaster and I said, hey, we would love to use your beans at our new facility. Would you mind coming in and training my staff? Would it be okay if I went to your coffee shop? Because it's not a direct competitor, right? The people who are visiting local trendy coffee shops are not going to be the same people visiting the play cafe. So I said, is it okay if I work a couple shifts there, get to know your layout, see how the space is run, see what people are most likely to order, see the order of operations of everything, learn how to make the lattes and cappuccinos and things like that. Would it be okay if I go through your training process and if somebody from, from your business came and trained us? And they said, absolutely. So they have a big incentive in your success because if you're ordering beans from them constantly, they want you to be successful because you're going to become one of their cornerstone, most essential clients because they have to get through the recession as well, right? It's not just us. So even if you have no cafe experience, you can do this. I promise you, there are people out there locally who are equipped to help you and who are willing to help you at either no cost or low cost. And then a lot of people also have this fear that the cafe equipment is going to be way too expensive. But last time I checked, which was not that long ago, there are tons of commercial espresso, ma espresso machines, commercial coffee makers and things like that on the used market. So you can buy a $20,000 espresso machine for $8,000 and it's still under warranty or there's someone local that might be able to help you service it. There are definitely ways to save on your on your startup costs of your cafe. There's ways to be really smart about going about it. I have an entire training about what you need, what you don't need, what to save on, what to splurge on in Playmaker Society. And when it is one of my most watched, most appreciated lessons, we talk about ice machines. We talk about, um, again, espresso machines, coffee makers, fridges, under the counter fridges, things like that. So that is definitely something that I'm very passionate about. So I make sure I make it as easy and as no as much of a no-brainer process as possible for my Playmaker Society members. Because again, not only does your cafe add to your bottom line for open play, it also made us a couple hundred dollars every single party we hosted. Because once one person orders the latte, all the parents order a latte. And because we served generally younger kids, parents weren't dropping their kids off and leaving at the birthday parties. They were sticking around. And we had large family parties with lots of adults. So just think about it, a couple hundred dollars every single time you host a party on top of the party bill. And that's not something, that's not a check you're going to have to give the party parent. Parents had no problem paying a couple dollars out of pocket to be able to sit down and enjoy a nice latte or a tea or a cappuccino or a bubble tea or something like that during the party. They were more than happy to pay for that. And same goes with every single event you host. Same goes with your memberships. You can offer free coffee. That just adds so much incentive for somebody to purchase your membership. So again, I have an entire podcast series about 
why your business needs a cafe, which I will link, you're going to be able to pay for all of your equipment within just a couple months if you go about it in the correct way. So I'm going to link that podcast series, but again, you can do it and it's going to make a huge difference in your business in ways that you probably don't even realize right now. All right, I'm off my soapbox. Number eight, physical products and e-commerce. I definitely see a lot more indoor playground owners putting more of an emphasis on online sales because again, we're coming up on a a recession. I know I sound like a broken record, but by increasing your customer base, by being able to sell toys and retail items to people all over the country or even the world, it's going to really unlock a new revenue stream and allow you to serve people that you would have never had the opportunity to service before. Again, whether that's retail products, whether that's digital downloads or worksheets or activity kits or subscription boxes. I know Alicia from Gentle Hands Play Cafe, I mentioned her already, but she also does subscription boxes and play kits and uh, sensory bins and things like that, that people can purchase no matter where they live because she ships it. Tal from Art Factory and Play Cafe, she does balloon delivery. So even if somebody doesn't have a young child, if someone's graduating or if somebody is having a retirement party or if a local corporation needs an art, art, uh, balloon arc, arch or something like that, um, she's able to go to them and deliver that. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But I definitely have seen a big emphasis on creating a customer base that we wouldn't typically think of for an indoor playground. But if you're going to teach yourself balloons, if you're going to put together these kits, Don't just sell them locally. Don't just serve people with young children. Think outside the box. Expand the amount of potential customers that you have, whether that's more people locally in different different age ranges or demographics, or whether that's people in a completely different town, state, or country. You really need to start thinking outside the box so that this revenue stream becomes more protected and more versatile. All right. Trend number nine is mobile businesses. So I kind of alluded to this in the last one, but balloon deliveries, mobile play deliveries. A lot of people are still feeling more comfortable celebrating at their own homes or celebrating outside. So this is just another way to expand your base of potential customers by offering to come to them with your services, whether that's play equipment, whether that's event planning services, whether that's balloon deliveries, whether that's party favors or something like that. I've seen definitely a lot more businesses becoming location independent. So if somebody doesn't want to have a party at your facility or if you're completely booked, again, by having the option to go to them, you're going to be able to make a lot more money and you're going to be able to serve a lot more people. And again, this is a perfect example of really increasing the amount of potential revenue that you can have even if you're keeping your revenue streams the same. So parties, just by offering the option to come to them, you could potentially double the amount of parties that you're able to do. So I really want you to kind of think outside the box when it comes to your actual physical space and think outside that. Think of how else you can use the assets in your business, your balloon machine, your soft play equipment. Think of how you can use it in a new different way again, to increase your base of potential customers. And then finally, number 10, I mentioned this the last two years, but I would be remiss if I did not mention it again, but I've seen so many more play spaces becoming a lot more inclusive to people with all abilities. So even if a space isn't made specifically for kids on the autism spectrum or with physical disabilities, I've seen a lot more owners be much more cognizant of how they can better accommodate, again, children of all abilities, even if it's not their primary focus. So I've seen a lot more indoor playgrounds adding quiet corners or sensory corners for not just kids on the autism spectrum or kids with sensory processing issues, just toddlers that are a little bit overwhelmed and need some time away from the hustle and bustle of the play area. Or maybe it's a mom who is nursing who just needs to take a step away from the noise so that baby can latch without getting distracted. Or Maybe a child fell asleep in the baby carrier and mom or dad just needs a place to kind of sway back and forth in a a more quiet space. Um, I've seen a lot more people put emphasis on, um, again, a lot of gross motor play and even fine motor play that is made specifically for kids with autism or 
children on the spectrum or uh, children with sensory processing disorder. But what I love about a lot of that equipment and a lot of those toys is that even though it's made specifically for that type of child, it's so universally enjoyed by all children. So for example, um, my six-year-old son who is autistic, he loves um, the swings. So any of those hanging swings that he can rock in. Yes, he absolutely loves it. And he also has one in his OT room at school, but his older brother who is neurotypical also loves it. It's one of the most popular attractions at the indoor playground that we love to visit. So I've definitely seen a huge focus and a lot more people put a priority on inclusivity and better accommodating kids of all abilities. Again, whether that is um, a neurodivergent customer or whether that's a child with a physical disability, I've definitely seen a lot more owners put a lot more thought into planning to better accommodate them. And I actually have a five-part series about how to better accommodate both children and autistic adults. And that is also on my podcast, which I will link. But I absolutely love that owners are doing a lot more research. They're educating themselves a lot more than in the past because, again, education has really been a lot more pervasive, which I absolutely love, again, as a mom of an autistic child, I take more notice than probably the average person, but it's so appreciated. And the same goes with food allergies. I also just put out a podcast episode with a food allergy expert, and I've noticed a lot more indoor playgrounds being a lot more careful when accommodating food allergies and being more inclusive. Whereas a couple of years ago, a lot of indoor playgrounds would just say, play at your own risk, you know, it's, it's you know, a nut, um, I forget what the wording they use is, they don't use nut free facility, but like nut aware facility, meaning we encourage parents to leave nuts at home, but we don't require hand washing or, you know, we don't ban nuts or anything like that. So I've seen a lot more indoor playground owners, again, educating themselves about food safety awareness, um, about food allergies and things like that. So I absolutely love that we're creating more opportunities for more children to play. And that just warms my heart. And I am Again, just putting it into the universe that I hope this trend continues in 2023 and beyond because, again, it's appreciated by parents across the board. All right, well, that wraps up today's video for the trends that I am predicting in 2023 and beyond. If you have any questions or anything you'd like me to cover more in depth or if I missed a trend, please comment and let me know. I love to do follow-up videos or part twos of videos, but I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you have a restful and joyful and safe and healthy holiday season with your family. We're about to get hit with a winter storm. So I'm putting this uh, video out a little bit earlier than normal, but I hope you enjoyed it. And I will meet you right back here at the end of 2023 to kind of recap and see if my trend predictions were right. All right, head to the video description for links again on deeper dives on all of these topics, memberships, cafe sales, um, better accommodating autistic children and adults. I have all of that information linked and this is the perfect time to kind of binge on those podcast series and YouTube videos while you're home and resting with your family. All right, have a great day and happy holidays.